When you have doctors and airline pilots that are backing a new idea about aviation, I get interested. Then as I watch the video, it looks like it was written by somebody on, well, TikTok. I'm not sure why all the videos that lack all common sense are the ones that trend on social media. And if you haven't figured it out, this video is gonna be a bit controversial. Guys, look up, over there. You see a plane with clouds behind it? Today, and for the first time ever, I'm going to explain to you what these things are and how this may be the easiest way to tackle global warming. Whether you believe in global warming or not, I personally think that you can't just trash the environment that you live in without any repercussions. But if you're trying to convince me about a new concept or a new idea, you can't have someone get on the screen saying be careful of airplane clouds. Because those aren't clouds, they're called contrails. And then have the announcer say this. Today, and for the first time ever, I'm going to explain to you what these things are. I have no idea who this guy is or what his channel is about, but this guy, Mr. Nas Daily, sure is excited to be on camera. And having the very opening scene have something like this on it lets me know you're already going to try to use some type of scare tactic. Danger from airplane clouds? I already know this is going to be stupid, but let's see what he's got to say. Airplanes, they're amazing, but sometimes when an airplane passes through very cold and humid air, its water vapor turns into a cloud. When planes fly, they leave behind a mix of uh, vapors and exhaust gases in the sky. We call this a contrail. The issue is that these clouds stay in the sky for hours, or even days at a time. As you know, these clouds trap heat and contribute to global warming. A lot of contrails, they create a sort of a blanket in the sky and they don't allow the heat coming from down to dissipate in the atmosphere. And that's why they affect the global warming. Almost 60% of the negative impact of aviation comes from contrails, all because an airplane passed through cold and humid air. Is it possible for a contrail to stay in the air for hours or days? I guess under perfect situations, yes, but I just walked outside and I shot this video yesterday and you can see this is typically what you see when you look into the sky and look at a contrail. This is what it looks like. Now when I'm flying, if I end up seeing a contrail that's out there, let's say that was from 30 minutes before, I don't know if it was from 30 minutes before or from, from 40 hours before, but typically speaking, your contrails are going to be dissipating because the winds are going to shift and they're just going to break down because the temperatures are going to be changing and so the contrail is going to dissipate. That's the norm. So when he says this, the issue is that these clouds stay in the sky for hours or even days at a time. If that was true, the skies over busy airspace would be covered and they'd be sitting there for days. But if you look outside, you'll typically see that those contrails are gone in 10 or 15 seconds. Maybe it's possible they sit up for an hour or two. I've seen some that have hung around for a while, but creating days where there's a blanket that's covering everything, I've never seen that before. Next, we need to talk about this statement right here. As you know, these clouds trap heat. So it is true that on a cloudy day that the clouds do work kind of as a blanket. That was the way it was explained to me when I was a kid. And those blankets help to keep everything a little bit warmer in the city. However, let's imagine that this is your city with clear skies and the heat is rising off of it. But now that I put this string over it, the heat can't get out. Yep, that all checks out to me. So next time you go by Starbucks, just make sure when they try to give you a lid, just say, oh no, no, I got my string. I'll keep all my heat in that way. And to just take your tea, put your dental floss over it, and it's gonna be warm all day. And then they said this statement, which confused me even more, and I had to do some research on it. Almost 60% of the negative impact of aviation comes from contrails. So hold on here. What you're telling me is that when I do a super long flight and burn, let's say, 25,000 gallons of gas, which would not be a, an obscene amount, it would be something that would be pretty normal actually. When I go do a flight like that and I burn all that gas, you're telling me that this, the biggest impact is actually going to be the contrail that's out there for a few minutes while I'm flying, not all the gas that I just burnt? That doesn't make any sense. Have you ever flown into LA and seen all the car pollution? Those cars don't have contrails and seen cities that have tons of factories. There's no contrails from those factories and the sky is pretty dark and grim when you come into some of those cities. So you're telling me 60% of the impact that I create 
on global warming is actually not from the gas that I'm burning, but from the contrails that go out the back of my plane for a couple minutes at a time? Who's doing this research? I actually had to dig around on the internet and I guess this is where the numbers came from. This was an article that was published on BBC which says, may account for more than half, 57% of the entire climate impact of aviation. So unlike the people from TikTok that just publish crazy scary videos, I like to do a little bit of research before I go make a video about something, there is a difference between may create that impact and does create that impact. I just thought I would notate that difference, but listen to what he says here. 60% of the negative impacts of aviation comes from contrails. Oh, but just wait, it gets so much better. Here's the best part. We can fix this problem easily. Just by making a few changes to the flight path by using technology. Take Etihad Airways, for example. It's the first airline fixing the contrails problem today. what they're doing. Before a flight, the pilots and navigation teams look at tons of weather data to avoid storms. But they also use it to avoid cold and humid air. How? By simply flying a few hundred meters above or below it. It sounds simple, but there is a lot of artificial intelligence and computations involved in the process. Well, they sure love throwing out some key buzzwords that people love to hear. This problem can be fixed easily. Technology, artificial intelligence. When you're flying around, something that you may or may not have noticed is that when you're flying east or when you're flying west, depending on the direction that you're going in, you will be flying at an odd number altitude or an even number altitude. Let's say, for example, you're going from New York to LA. You'll typically be flying at an even number altitude. So you might be at 36,000 feet or 34,000 feet or 38,000 feet. You get the idea. And when you're doing LA to New York, you're going to be at an odd number. So 35,000, 37,000, 39,000. If next time you're on a flight, usually if you listen to when the pilot makes his announcement and says, oh, well, today we'll be flying at 36,000 feet, you'll be flying westbound. So the first issue is that pilots, when we're flying, we use feet, regardless of where you're from. We use feet, not meters. And I'm not saying that feet are better than meters. I'm just saying that the planes are built and most of the planes are working around feet. There is one place that loves using meters and the pilots actually have to use this chart here to get as close to the right altitude in feet as they can so that way they can match it in meters. So it's just a little piece of information to know. And it's relevant because of this. By simply flying a few hundred meters above or below it. Now because we're talking about temperatures, temperatures are not going to be holding to a very specific range. They're not going to be only in this 2,000 foot range are there going to be contrails. That's not how it's going to work. You could have a range be from let's say 37,000 to 39,200. Let's say that's the range in which contrails can be developed. So here you have a very unique situation. So you're flying out east and this is the range when the contrail is being developed. 37,000 to 39,200. You can't just call up air traffic control and say, hey, air traffic control, I wanna to fly today at 39,300 feet. That is not how it works. We fly at full altitudes, meaning 39,000, 40,000, 41,000. We fly at a thousand intervals of what we're gonna be doing when we're flying. And that's because they want to have separation between the planes. Safety first. That's like the number one priority. So you're not going to have a plane flying at 39,300 because then you have it very close to a plane that's, let's say, at 40,000. Well, the planes have certain restrictions when we're flying. And if the plane is very heavy, it may not be able to get up to that altitude. This is a picture of the flight computers that we have on our aircraft. And as you can see, both pilots have identical computers. They say it's because they want us to be able to be more efficient in how we work, but I think it's just so the first officers don't get jealous that the captains have all the cool toys and computers because I, I flew in an airline that only the captain had the computer and it was very lonely over there without a computer to play with while you were in flight. Anyway, you can see on my computer screen as I zoom in, look at this section right here. Now we are currently flying at flight level 390, which is also known as 39,000 feet. And as you can see, the recommended altitude here is 39,000 feet. So we're flying at the most efficient altitude we can. And remember, in this scenario, 37,000 to 39,200, that's the danger zone where all the contrails are happening and we obviously can't let that happen because 
then no heat is going to be able to get away from Earth. So based off of my computer now, that leads me two options. I can climb to 41,000 feet or descend to 35,000 feet. Now pilots are always going to want to stay at the higher altitude. At the higher altitude, you're going to have a much more fuel efficient flight. And we want to be fuel efficient because we always want to have extra gas when we're getting to our destinations. So if we go down to 35,000 feet or flight level 350, we're going to be burning a lot more gas, especially when you're talking about a flight that could be 10 or 15 hours long. That is a lot of extra gas that you're going to burn unnecessarily. So then of course people say, we'll go to 41,000. You can see in this scenario here, the max this plane can do right now is flight level 415. That's 41,500 feet. Now typically when pilots are flying, when they're doing long haul flights like this, we like to have a buffer. You don't want to put your plane at the very edge of the envelope because then you have the risk of having all kinds of things happen which are not good, which just don't really pertain to this video. Just trust me that you're not going to want your pilots flying at the edge of the envelope with you in the back. It's going to be uncomfortable if something doesn't go perfectly right. Could the plane do it? Sure, but you're, you're not going to want to do it. Just as a rule of thumb, typically pilots want to have 1,000 to 1,500 feet of buffer. So in this scenario here, to go to 41,000 feet, we would have a 500 foot buffer. Could you do it? You could do it, but it wouldn't be recommended. You'd want to have it say 42,000 or 42,500. You'd want to see something like that before you climb to 41,000. So we're here at 39,000, 41,000 is not an option. 37,000 has the dangerous contrails, which means our only option right now is 35,000. So by going down to 35,000, you can burn a couple extra tons of gas. You're talking about thousands of pounds of gas that are burned in order to go down to 35,000 feet instead of flying at the really efficient altitude of 39,000. So you're telling me that by going to 35,000 feet, and burning a bunch more extra gas during this long flight, but not having a contrail, that that is more efficient and better for the environment than flying at the altitude and having there be a line behind the plane for uh, probably a minute or two. You're telling me that's your logic. That's what you're telling me, Mr. Nas Daily? Okay. The other thing I found really interesting is when he said this. But they also use it to avoid cold and humid air. Look, I didn't do really well in school. I've never claimed to be very smart, but you know, typically speaking, the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. So you're telling me that by flying again around this area, which could be, I don't know how many miles, but I'm guessing a decent amount of miles. So you're flying way around this amount of cold, humid air where the dangerous contrails come out. And now you're burning a bunch of extra gas to go around this area. So we're flying lower, burning more gas, and now also flying around this cold, humid area that's burning more gas, but we're doing it to avoid the contrails, which may cause up to 57% of the global warming from aviation. That logic is brought to you by the same person who brought you this. We can fix this problem easily. Oh, you think they're done? <laughs> oh no, there's more. So what we do as pilot is uh, we look at this uh, forecast that Sadavia gives us and we avoid uh, uh, flying into these areas by flying above them or below them in order to fly in areas where uh, there is uh, less chance of producing contrails behind us. And this innovative solution changes everything. When a plane flies outside the contrail area, there will be no contrails that stay behind. No trapping of heat, nothing. Just the plane taking you to your destination. Passengers won't feel the change in altitude, but the environment's impact reduces by a lot. In the last five months alone, Etihad has reduced its carbon footprint by 5,000 tons, and it keeps going down. Just think about that. The exact science is still being developed. But if every airline in the world did this, we could reduce the speed of global warming globally and keep our skies shining blue. Did he just say he could reduce the speed of global warming globally? We could reduce the speed of global warming globally. And more good news from them. It sounds like it's, it's not the gas that's burned during this extremely long flight that's the problem. It, no, it's not that, it's the, it's the contrails. That's a danger, at least that's what he's implying when he says this. When a plane flies outside the contrail area, there will be no contrails that stay behind. No trapping of heat, nothing, 
Just the plane taking you to your destination. Sure, I guess that's a number that can be massaged to work to really make it sound like anything you want it to sound like. Look what I just found. The new Airbus A380 and Airbus 220, Boeing 787, ATR600, Embraer E2 aircraft use less than three liters of jet fuel per 100 passenger kilometers. This matches the efficiency of most modern compact cars. So I don't know how accurate that is. I think that there is a certain amount of manipulation that happens because whoever's paying for the research to happen, I think things end up falling more in their favor. So who paid for that study? I don't know, but they're saying that roughly 2.1% of the impact of global warming is coming from aviation. If we could just get this string to stop covering up the top of this cup, 60% of that impact will go away. If you want to do something about the carbon footprint that you're doing, stop buying stuff in other countries and then paying for them to get shipped all the way over. There's no easy way like this guy is saying it, just like there's no take a pill and get super ripped. It's not the way it works. If you want to do something, then you're just going to have to bite the bullet and pay extra and have things that are made somewhere nearby to where you live. Do stuff locally. Stop buying stuff in a different country. I don't know, you can do the research and figure out which country is the most polluting country that's out there, but you could stop buying from countries like that and then buy something locally. It's gonna cost you more money, but then you're not having the cost of it being made over there in a way that is probably negative to the environment, and then you're paying for somebody like me to fly that thing from that place over to whatever country you're in, and then for it to be transported on the ground and the impact of, from the environment of that. Like, if you want to do something, then that would be a lot better than having these planes flying at a lower altitude and burning more gas or flying around the outside of something, so that way they're burning more gas. I mean, I, again, not a scientist, didn't do great in high school uh, chemistry, but that makes literally no sense to me. If you can show me the science that this thing right here is causing 60% of the impact, I'm gonna be really impressed. If you enjoyed this video, check out one of these two over here. I look forward to hearing from you. Until then, keep the blue side up.